kata or form, because that's where a lot of the moves that I teach are hidden. Now the moves that you see in any of my takes, and especially this take, if you do practice them, it should be limited. You shouldn't apply excessively hard moves on the pressure points. In my takes, I constantly refer to the six main pressure points of the arm. We have pressure points of the leg, we have pressure points of the body. You can actually get any acupuncture or acupressure book and see where the points are. A kata or form, and the reason I refer to that, recorded the angle and the direction that was needed to work a pressure point or that move would not have worked. It's that simple. 750 years ago, the first Tai Chi kata was developed. It was a very long and lengthy kata. Out of that kata came the other people's katas with the pressure points and the moves that they liked. I always tell people that, you know, you might have read a book. I've read, done a lot of reading. I've done a lot of research. I have 30 years in the martial arts. I've studied with everybody, almost who is anybody in the United States. I've studied with five 10th degree black belts from Okinawa. I have notes. I have been invited to major medical universities for study on what I do. I have participated in dissecting the human body, finding nerves and pressure points. And I'm working right now with a major medical university on what the body pressure points do to control the heart, the liver, the kidney, the head, the spleen, the stomach. But that 750 years ago, the original kata of Tai Chi recorded all the angle and direction needed for every one of the 500 to 700 pressure points. You might have read in books that there was a man who only knew one kata, and yet he could kill people. He was the deadliest man that walked in Okinawa. I read that. I always thought, well, how if he knew one kata? Or if it took 10 years to master a kata? Why did they need 10 years to master a kata? And in this country, every two months, they want you to learn another kata. What's more important, if I teach you another kata, or I take I walk into seminars. I do seminars and lecture all over the United States. And I do a seminar and I say, how many katas do you know? And a black fellow say, 20. If I teach you one more, you know 21, will you be any more deadly? No, he says. How about if I take one of those and teach you how to apply the self-defense? That every time you do that kata, you are working a self-defense pattern that's going to work on your opponent and every time you do it, it will tell you the angle and the direction that you need to get on the pressure points of the body. That's how these masters that had their moves hidden could do one kata and injure somebody with the moves. They knew one kata and they knew 20 or 30 ways to kill somebody with the kata. Now when I talk about kata, I have talked to jujitsu people who do not do kata. I've talked and taught Hapkido people. I show them pressure points. They don't have to do kata. If you don't want to do kata, don't do kata. I'll show you the pressure point, the angle, and the direction. I'm going to show you moves today in a kata. You can break it down on your own. You can be self-defense. You do not need the kata. But I've had one of the highest teachers of people in the world discuss this with me, and he told me, now I wish in the past, I don't learn the kata. Jiu-Jitsu people do the self-defense techniques. Hapkido to do the self-defense techniques. But you think back to the day of the samurai, and he had these deadly moves that he put into a pattern so that he would remember them and could practice them dry run. If I write them down and put them in a book, you know, so many people want to come to my seminars make notes. Those notes go home, they go on a tour, and they don't study. If they practice the kata, they would actually be practicing the move, the angle, and the direction, and the stance that's needed 
to use their weight to their betterment and their opponent's weight against them. Stance is most important because if you're not standing properly, everybody in the world uses a front stance. And weight and weight distribution is most important because if you're not in a front stance properly, your leg can be broken. Meaning your leg, not your opponent's. When you have an opponent, and you can try this at home, because I want you to know first why we stand in a lowered stance. Everybody says lower the center of gravity. Better for the balance. Bend the legs so that it meets resistance for breaking. That's true. But you're also taught, we have a line on the floor. You're also taught that if your feet are not aimed at your opponent, your leg can be broken. And the reason I tell you that, because in kata, we start some kata like this. The feet are 45 degree angles. And we have some kata that start and just do this. The feet just go from 45 to straight ahead. That has a meaning. Everything in the cup has a meaning. The feet, the hands, the head, even the eyes have a meaning. If the feet do not aim straight ahead, your leg could be broken by your opponent. That's what that tells you. If you don't believe me, stand up and get in a front stance of your particular style. Aim your foot at an imaginary opponent and wiggle your knee side to side. Dip your knee. Aim your foot, your forward foot, just a little bit away. That's wrong. That's improper. Your instructor somewhere has probably corrected you, or someone in class said, get your feet pigeon toe. Get your feet pigeon toe. The real reason is that that leg is not aimed at your opponent, the forward leg. That leg can be broken because of joint alignment. Improper joint alignment if the foot's aimed wrong. The knee joint moves like this, like my hands. Moves this way. To break or do damage to someone's knee, you only have to send it a different direction mainly to the side. If I aim my foot, and you stand in a front stance, and aim your foot a little bit wrong, and you move your knee like this, you will feel that it is coming out, or almost comes out of the socket by itself. You will feel the weakness. Aim it in, and wiggle it, you will feel strength. Aim it out, and try to protect your groin or inner leg area. You can't. You can't protect the groin, you can't protect the inner leg because you can't dip. Your knee will come out of place, try it. So this move in the kata, just this, means you can block and protect. If somebody tried to kick my legs and groin out, I can just move and protect that area and be perfectly balanced. But if you're like this, you can't. You can't protect. So being more natural means that if someone tries to kick at my lower section, I can just block by doing dipping. Just dip, and I can block and protect my own knee or my groin area by just dipping the knee, quick. So it's very important that your foot, the forward leg, be aimed at your opponent at all times. Now there are times that we start a cut and the feet do not come together. They stay like that. That is generally used for self-defense when someone grabs you behind. You have kata from the front, you have kata from the back. Someone grabs you in the back, the feet are aimed that way because you have balance from back to front. If the feet aim out, 
The nerves on the inside of the legs are right here. You actually pull them forward so that at least these can't be kicked or used against you. So there's a meaning for that stance. But I really want to explain the meaning of that stance because a lot of people do not know why the feet pull together or why we stand pigeon toes. Because of that explanation, I've explained on other tapes that a lot of sport karate developed in like 1906 when it was sent into schools and a full twist punch was a sport punch because they didn't want kids hurting each other. But they didn't realize how many black belts would come out of that program and make more black belts and make more black belts and get carried away all over the world. I can document everything I say in people's books with records and tapes muscle specialist, nerve specialist, and bone specialist. The stance is the most important. I say this, but the rear stance was a sports stance. My opponent can front kick me all the way down the leg in the near nerves on the inside, plus kick the leg that way with a front kick to break it, or kick this knee, get in a rear stance and do this. It's a modification of a cat stance. That's what a rear stance is for. Modification of a cat stance. Only stances, and I'm going to come back in a future tape and cover just the stances. But the only stances we use are a horse, a front stance, a cat stance, and a crossover stance, and that's used for energy and it should transfer energy. That's why we have stances that cross in a kata or a form, because we are, our goal is to learn pressure points and be able to transfer the energy from our body into our opponent. And the only place that you can enter pain into an opponent's nervous system is at a pressure point. There's several arts that we get involved with, that I am involved with study, but there is an art of attacking the nerves and the pressure points. I am involved in that study. There is, a nerve, there is an art that attacks the blood flow. I have several places in the body you can just clap on, and the blood stoppage happens and the person passes out. There is also an art of attacking the muscles. And you can tap muscles and their pressure points, and the muscle refuses to function for a few seconds, which allows you to close at your opponent. I'm going to demonstrate. We're going to get a student to demonstrate a kata. And as I explained a minute ago, you do not have to know a kata when we get to the breakdown of the kata. I'm showing this because a lot of martial artists do form. You can be a Tai Chi. You can be a hard style, you can be jujitsu, you can just pick up the self-defense def techniques and understand how it come out of a kata or form. And a kata or form, when I say this at a lot of seminars, they look, it stirs some emotion, but there are no locking techniques. In every kata, in every form, a samurai did not practice blocking. Blocking is natural. If you have a, a, a little kid, you try to hit him, he immediately goes like that. Remember when you were a kid, they want to spank your hiney, both hands went to your hiney. You will block naturally, and blocking gets developed during the freestyle fighting portion of karate. You don't practice blocking. How much practice would this be of timing? You need timing to get blocking down right. So that happens during freestyle fighting. Your self-defense, if taken out of your kata, will be real, and every time you do your kata, you are practicing your real self-defense. And the only reason I've decided to show a lot of this information is because people in the United States have developed good self-defense. Strength, mobility, strong, we have some excellent fighters. Some of the best, I think the best in the world. But what I saw was a separation 
of them doing self-defense from their kata. They do a kata and then their self-defense is just bip, 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 bip. Where in fact they could get self-defense right from a kata or form and give it true meaning. And then when you do the kata and no one's around, you feel better because you know why you're doing the move. Rather than most Americans that look like robots up doing forms. I'm going to get Mr. Ron Richards up to do a kata. And as I said before, you don't have to do. But if you want to learn this kata, we'll put it on tape. He'll do it normal. He'll do it slow. And then we will give you a breakdown. Mr. Ron Richards.
in my theory on this subject, I only can surmise what the man must have meant because I do know that angle and direction are in kata, and I do know that kata tells you the pressure points, angle and direction. The angle and the direction needed to attack pressure points. We're going to break down that kata, and I know that the Gojuru styles, they do it slow with tension, and they have one explanation, but they should have more explanations. Some do. I have many explanations. I have a basic, an intermediate, and an advanced explanation. Usually the explanations means basic, sticking in arm pressure points, and staying on these six pressure points that we cover in our video. Now I want to explain the pressure points quick with this video, because we have two in the arms at the wrist. And a lot of times, you have found these because you grab an opponent by the wrist and do a technique. The other two, right where this muscle ends is the best place to say where it's at. And then the other one is opposite that. But the other two are here. This one lies in between these two muscles, will numb the arm, but it has feelers right here which will control the legs. This particular pressure point will cause the bending of the elbow when struck with the proper angle and direction that would be in a kata. If you know these six pressure points, plus any others that I show you on this tape, there's a pressure point that lies on the back of the hand here. We also have a pressure point that lies in here. A lot of people know of this pressure point in here but they don't show me the right angle and direction. A lot of people know that when you go push down, your opponent drops. Uh, Terry, come in here. She's still there. Go on. There you go. Okay. This particular pressure point, the energy, comes down the arm, crosses over, and goes back. Goes down the arm, crosses, and goes back. We want energy transfer, we want to tap into that energy. This particular pressure point needs pushed that direction, not down. I have been to, to a lot of some events, seminars, and they say with a weapon that if somebody grabs you like this, that you are to push down and your opponent goes down. Bend the wrist and your opponent will drop. He does because you are rubbing the energy pattern, but you're not playing with the true pressure point. So if I do this, he goes down. But if I change and actually cut towards that, he goes down faster and it hurts him. He gets an electrical shock and sets him up for other pressure points to be hit. So this particular pressure point lies in here, but the angle and direction must be that way towards one's energy. The energy's flowing like that, and you back the energy up. In my other tapes, I have showed you how to stop the energy from getting to the wrist. I've showed you how to take the energy and actually open someone's fist so they can't hit you. This particular one sends the energy back, back the pattern and starts to drop your opponent and make him weak, weak because of the electrical charge. These pressure points are needed in the tape that we're going to do now, along with the kata suyujin that the Ishiguro stylists do. Uh, I know some uh, Japanese styles do it. I know Gojuru styles do it. And I want to give you some of my translation for breakdown. Just to open up that particular kata, you may or may not move your feet. That's up to you if you understand the way I started this film, that that happens with that. That means in a fight situation, your feet aim straight ahead. Sometimes we open up a kata with that, sometimes no. 
But if you do that, you know what it's for. This particular move to open up the kata is a man waving a fist in your face and you pushing on this pressure point, holding the two wrist pressure points and putting them down. I want to re-explain that the wrist pressure points are important to know that they're only a half inch away from the wrist. Because if this man grabs me in a self-defense situation, and if you are teaching a student, and in panic, let's say it's a girl, and she grabs the arm, hold tight, and you're not on a pressure point, these techniques do not work. You must, by accident, people have found that there are pressure points there. But if I'm on these two pressure points and torque them, then my opponent will go and get off of me. So that's why it's important to know that there are pressure points and why there are pressure points is because you have three nerves in the arm, and right here is a cross track that connects them, and here is a cross track, and here is a cross track. So a pressure point is operating with more than one nerve and operating on a juncture, feeding information into the nervous system to make the legs go, to make the wrist go. And that's what the pressure points are all about that we're going to show you now. So that move is pushing on that pressure point holding these two pressure points to put your opponent down. Just the next move in the kata, I'm gonna have him start the kata. Sandy, you can come out and assist with this. So his first move in the kata would be that. That's a self-defense technique. He already has one self-defense technique to practice at home. Just that. Somebody waves a fist in your face. You push there, put them down there. That's one. Now he steps out. Go back to this move. The hand should stay here for a second, at least the way we, we teach you. You go out and the hand stays for a second and then comes up. Just this, just this stepping, just this stepping out means that if ever you grab a person's and 
close quarter fighting, your goal is to get your opponent's hand as far away from his body and as close to your section here to do your technique. That's your goal. And I bring a lot of moves out of the kata as grappling. Because how do mugging situations and fight situations take place? They never take place at the range. He and I are not going to fight like this. We're not going to freestyle fight. A self-defense situation starts here. We're arguing. Let's go. Boom! That's how it starts. It doesn't start back here. Oh, it might, but then we can make close and say, can't hear you. We get up close. Now I don't know if my man is going to punch me or kick me. We get close. It's a grappling situation. If he grabs, we have a pressure point. If he punches, we have a pressure point that we attack. And the moves were hidden in the katas as a grappling portion of the art. Now Ron's just going to do, I'm going to have Sandy do the self-defense on Ron because he is larger and we want to show you how it works. But we want to show you why this, why this, why this, and I do know that some styles do it differently. Some styles do this slow attention, and some styles do this this way or this way, etc. I did explain to you that every move in a kata can injure and kill, but that's the advanced meaning if you knew and understood all the moves and all the angle and all the direction and all the pressure points, which means you'd be pretty advanced to do that. Kata for a beginner is angle, direction, balance, coordination. But kata for a person who's in the pressure points helps his study because it tells the right way, the right angle, and the right direction. Every pressure point in the body, none of them can be attacked straight on. None of them. That's why there are so many moves that are different angle and directions in these forms. And again, if you only mastered one, I will give you the basic explanation. There is an intermediate and there is an advanced explanation. As I give you the, our most basic explanation, I think you'll get some learning enjoyment from this. Sandy is going to stand facing the camera. Ron is going to be behind her. This particular kata in our system is taught as the second kata. We have a kata seisan, some call hangetsu, as our first kata. Seisan deals with a lot of self-defense from the front. One or two self-defense from the rear. This kata deals with self-defense from behind. Ron is going to, she's going to show just the explanation for this move. First of all, she goes, as she's being grabbed, her goal is to stop the arms. So you grab, and she would stop the arms right where the cock is, which means Ron is pulling into her muscles. This is the muscles group. That's what is the key that it tells me my opponent's behind. We block with the muscles because that's our strength. Some explanations that I have seen for this kata say that this move is blocking a grab from the front. Wrong, because you have no power to stop anybody from the front that way. You can't hold your arms like this and stop them if they're squeezing in front of you this direction. Then I was told that these moves are blocking kicks. I thought that doesn't make sense. Why are my opponents off in angles? Why are two people kicking? I'm not Superman, I can just go like this, stop kicks. My fingertips would get broken. You can't stop with a small bone in the arm or kick. A punch or a kick should be blocked with two bones at the same time. The smallest bone in the arm is very brittle and breaks. The largest bone of the arm 
It takes three to five times the power to break it than it does the small one, but both simultaneously, 15 times the amount of power to break them both. Almost impossible to break them both at the same time. Not impossible, but almost with both together because of the strength. So you should two bone block, two bone block. So that tells you that you're not blocking. Why would you block with your pressure points aimed out? Why would you block with the small bone of the arm to someone doing this? And then why would this be blocking kicks? So that shows it's not from the front, but that someone's grabbing you from the rear, and they're pulling into the muscle, and you have a two-bone block taking place. Grab from the rear, she has a two-bone block taking place. Just this move means to get him where your power is, and this move means to put him down. Now let me get a little explanation and relax before we show that. Back up a second. <clears throat> when you do that kata, you are taught to step out in a side stance. Step out in a side stance, and again step in a side stance. In our system, we would teach somebody to go out, go out, we would even have them back up, back up, before we teach them the hand moves. This, you could go either way, back or forward. We have a subject, the step, just as I told you with the feet aiming in like this, the stepping is as much a part of the hand move as the hand move. If this is proper, she has proper weight distribution and power with a two bone block so that he can't squeeze your arms towards you. This means to grapple with your opponent's hands, grab them and get them below your breast to operate. We're going to show you two self-defense techniques because even though there are three of these steps, a person grabs me from behind, I need the next step to complete the move on the man who grabbed me from behind. So what I'm saying is one and a half of these is one self-defense technique, and now somebody grabs me from behind, and this and one and a half is the next self-defense technique. It does not have to be three self-defense techniques. The step is part of the self-defense technique. We will explain that now. Ron is going to grab her, and she's going to block, which stops. She is going to grab the wrist, trying to grab at the wrist pressure points, but it's not that important as long as she quick grabs. She is going to take her right leg and back up through the hole and put his arm in what some people call an arm bar. The tighter she stretches it and the more she pushes, the quicker she will drop her opponent. Let's see it again. Grabs, slow, and you can try this move at home because it works on people. Now, this time when you do it, I'm going to correct right on film, go from here, but go right to the next Siyujan stance rather than a Seisan. Go right from one Siyujan as you would in the Kata. We don't want to change anything the way it looks in the Kata because that's what puts more pain and power on your opponent. So grab, and the right leg steps all the way over towards me. Grab his wrist. I hope they're behind you. Go back. Yeah. Bring your right leg all the way back here. Back here. And now push. Okay, let me, let me explain that move. Run. Grab. I stop. I grab the wrist. My right leg goes through, but I go to the same stance I was here. I go to the stance here, and then I can push for this move where the next move would be this in the kata, which would finish my man. And I would attack pressure points. That is an explanation for just one of these. Just one of these. This is part of it. I was told you're blocking a move in the front, you're blocking kicks, a person's punching, 
This is stopping it. This is grabbing him and running your fingers into his rib cage. You could not run those fingertips in anybody's rib cage that way and do damage. There are ways that you can, but not upside down like that. That move can be used towards the eyes or the throat in this situation. The next meaning for that move, for this, and this, come over here, I'm going to do it from the three quarters so you can see. I would stop the move. This means to grapple with his hands and put him down there. But we also have these two moves to contend with. So as I stop the move, I grab the hand, I twist it as I showed you earlier, like a cap. And if I go to my hip, all the way around like this, my opponent will be there and my hands will be the way they are in the cut on the hip. And my attack would then be to the temple or the head, and this one would be for the throat. In most cases, the person would not go down all the way. If you try this mildly, he really, as he grabs me, only goes to here, and then the attack and the strike would come in for the throat in this manner that you could actually do damage to the Adam's apple area. In slow motion, so you could get that, he grabs, I stop, a grab from behind. My feet aim out in a solution stance to pull my sciatic nerve forward. Pull this. It doesn't come forward, but it comes in here at a 45, which doesn't make it impossible for him to attack, but it makes it very difficult, and that's why the feet aim out. Had he been in front of me for this move, my feet could be aimed straight ahead, because if they're not aimed straight ahead, as I explained to open this video, your knee can be broken. They aim out because my opponent is behind me. And this stops the grab. Slow motion, this grabs the wrist. This gets on the hand. And all I have to do as I turn is go to this hip for that move. So as I grab, I go to this hip, and the turn is what puts my opponent in pain. And then a chop to the head and or this technique would be to the throat. And it can be under the arm if you are advanced enough to know the nerves and the pressure points under the arm. And they would be advanced techniques. When you get up to the third move, the third one was the self-defense from behind, but you turn with this move facing front to punch an opponent. Just this move, why do you hit the hand on the hand? Open hand, why do you do that? At least I have an explanation. It's used in a handshake, and or it looks like the person is going to kick you or punch you. Some katas at that point do this. They fold the arm. I have a, a meaning also for that. As you strike, I showed you the pressure point in here, and I showed you the pressure point here. These two work together because when you press in a handshake on this pressure point, it sends the energy that this pressure point will make his knees bend. You can just experiment with that, but don't hit it. You really, as in the kata, would strike it with these knuckles. That's why it's in the kata like that. If he takes from a handshake, I can put pressure here and strike on the pressure point with the knuckles. If you put the camera on that knee, I'll just tap, and you'll see the knees buckle. You have to watch doing that because this bone is very brittle. My particular notes that I have on this subject says that you have to back fist that pressure point with enough pressure to break the bone. But you do not have to break the bone to drop.
drop your opponent. So that's one meaning for that move. Some that do it like this, though. All I have to do is push on this pressure point by the thumb and come underneath on the wrist pressure point that you know and grab my own arm. And my opponent raises up and I can break his leg by kicking it. I wouldn't use this as my attack. I would kick the leg because if he's raised up like that, the leg can be broken. So that's just the explanation for this. Explanation for the elbow. Just the elbow technique. When you elbow in this manner, that means you are striking up because you are using the muscles. You are using the muscle portion of the arm. You do not try to hit someone or do this. That's why that's not a blocking technique. Using your small bone of the arm, you do not block with your pressure points which are aimed out. You use this portion of the arm to attack your opponent. Elbow coming up, hand coming to meet it, means there's a 50-50 application of grab a pressure point, the two on the wrist with this hand, and elbow behind his elbow, hit with the forearm, I mean, behind his elbow, and that's what this means. This means a 50-50 of hand pull down, two-way action. You must know two-way action to do a lot of these moves. Two-way action is work it one way, go the other. So as I pull this hand down, this would elbow to break his elbow, and that's what that move means in that particular cut. This move, this move goes off on a 45 degree angle. If the move is not worked properly, the opponent will not go down. I'm going to have Sandy come up and show you that move. He grabs, we're gonna do it slow. The pressure point is one half inch up from the wrist. She must make a fist and she must touch the fist on the pressure point. If she stands here facing her opponent and he grabs her and she tries to go for the pressure point, like a fist, and pushes down, he feels the pain, but it's not as severe as if she does exactly like the kata, steps to a 45 degree angle. She holds her opponent on, and now she steps 45, and now reverse it this way so you can see it in the camera. But do it here. She's facing her opponent, and she must go as in the kata, 45 degrees. That is on this pressure point. Your hammer fist goes to this pressure point and presses. So this move. I was told at one point was a power block. Somebody's kicking so strong and you're blocking with two hands. A little joke for a young man said, if you need to block with two hands, you shouldn't be in that fight. You need to block one of his moves with two hands. That's the wrong fight for you. Somebody grabs you, this means you grab him. And that move is going to drop him. Now how could a move, how could a move kill someone? Because the next move or the move before it helps that. In the advanced stages of this, I use the move just prior to that with that, or the move after it. I'm going to just show you that, how it works, because as she steps forward, then this move means go 45 degrees. We do it 45 if you know the kata. If you don't, you can do it as a single self-defense technique if she's doing it. And what's the next move in the kata? And strike. And she can hit into the eye, the temple, the ear, while being on that pressure point. That's the next move in the cut. And I wanted to show you how easy it is to apply. Back up. In slow motion, you can practice it with your partner 
grab, you hold them always. Because you don't hold them, the minute they feel this pain, they'll release, they'll get away. So he grabs, I hold them, I get on a pressure point, he goes down with my 45 as I step, that move would be a strike. Now in the kata, that move is there, that move is there, you step back and do just that move. I was told you're stepping back, blocking your kick. Again, it didn't seem right because it's the small bone of the arm. Why would I block with the small bone of the arm? I'd block with two bones simultaneously and the muscles grew. I step back, that arm is out, that represents an opponent grabbing that arm and I use this to break an arm. I'm just going to show you that in slow motion so you understand that move. In the kata, better come to this one. In the kata, I was like this, which means he grabs the arm that's forward naturally. In the kata, I step back with what looks like a down block, but this happens. I roll to the pressure point by the wrist, catch my opponent against my body, and come in for the strike point behind the arm. Doesn't this look like what was a down block in the kata? The move in the kata went here, and then we just stepped back and went like that. A better explanation than down block is he grabs the forward arm, we catch him, we step back, and when he struck here, the opponent goes down. Good explanation for that move and gives it much greater meaning. And if you practice that move over and over and over, the next time you do the kata and you do just what is known as a down block, you'll understand that it could be an arm break. I'm um, down here, but the power came from up top and it came down below, and you step back. When you do the next move, now people vary here. But this particular move in the kata has, my, has a hand resting on top. And then you step in for what we thought was a down block and step away practicing the other arm being grabbed. And you need to go to the left to work that technique. And just this particular move in the kata, this move tells you how to hit somebody in the solar plex region. A lot of people do not know how to hit the solar plex region. The solar plex region and this move you have to be careful if you practice on somebody because they can get sick from it. The solar plex region does not get hit in. Early on in this tape and previous tapes I've told people that none of the pressure points get struck straight in. Your body is geared from that. From the stomach up to the solar plex is a nerve that travels on that angle. When hit straight in, the power like leaves here. It's made to do that. Come over here. If I punch him in the solar plex, oh, he feels it and he can get weak. But if I punch him in the solar plex and I aim down, I make the power go all the way down to the stomach, which could make him sick because that particular nerve controls the gate that holds the food down. So if a person were drinking, had soda, had uh, alcohol, a lot of food, you hit him in that, it's coming up. So you better get out of the way. Maybe that's why you move on a 45 degree angle, that you get out of the way. But this reminds you, this reminds you, this hand just taps. It might be difficult to hit somebody down, but if I wouldn't have hit him, and I went to hit him down. You know, I was told this was a power punch. Well, two hands can't punch any harder than one hand. It's not a power punch. This just causes that hand to do that. So that as I hit, that happens. And then I could step in because if I did it hard, he would drop. And I step in and strike the face, the head, the temple, the neck. Then I am practicing the other arm being grabbed and an arm break. 
And that's what those particular sets of moves are for. The next move that I want to show you is just this move in that form. Just this move in that form. I was told at one point early on, and I'm making these tapes so that you get a different idea, a better explanation of some things I've found in my 30 years in the martial arts. I was told that this is blocking a kick, and this is blocking a high kick. I was told with a lot of katas, this hand's in a ready position. I said, ready for what? It's up here. They said, ready to attack your opponent. Well, then why would the weakest part of my body be towards my opponent? Why would my small bone be up? Why would my armpit, which is one of the weakest points of the whole body, be open? Why would my lungs be open and my body be open? Hmm. This move tells me that that's how I turn my opponent's hand as I strike down with this hand. If you know anything about acupuncture or acupressure, you will find that the laws of nature apply. It's hard to explain on a short video, but this is a heart pressure point line. It's heart, H-E-A-R-T. This represents fire. This is a lung pressure point, L-U-N-G, and it represents metal. In the laws of nature, and you can read it in any acupuncture books, so I don't have to dwell on that, but fire melts metal. If I go to this metal pedal pressure point, and I told you this numbs his whole arm, or hitting here on metal, this opens the hand. It hurts twice as much if I do hit fire first, or even touch fire, and I touch fire, and then go to metal. He goes down. You can play with that one at home, mild like that, but don't strike. I also want to tell you at this time that you have two bones in the arm. You have the small bone and the large bone. When the pressure point is pressed and it, the bones are seemingly coming together this way, that the opponent is very weak. In other words, my power is from small bone to large bone. My opponent is always weak. This move in the kata means to twist my opponent small bone up and hit him on metal. You do not have to know the acupuncture you do not even have to know pressure points. And you don't have to know the element of nature, the fire, the metal, because the angle and the direction is in your kata, and all of those were taken into consideration and covered for you. This move in a kata means if my opponent grabs or grapples with me, I turn his arm this direction and lift it up. This looks the same as in the kata, and I would hit this pressure point. When I am on fire and touch metal, he goes down. You can experiment with that without raising his hand up because in the kata, this should hit. If I twist this up and strike, he'll go down very rapidly and or could even pass out from the action because I am using the nature's destruction cycle of fire, metal. And it puts the person in a lot of pain. And that's just this move in that kata. We have the next move, which says, step with this, it goes with the strike. I am 
by striking with both arms bent at a 45 with my hammer fist to my open hand. Various reasons and explanations for that. And again, your style might do the kata a little different. You have to adjust and or find out your moves. When I go out and I teach a seminar, I try to see a person do a kata and help him find the angle and the direction that his creator of that kata might have thought. But again, we don't know because those people are dead. My arms are at a 45. This is how you read a kata, 45 degrees. That means I'm striking my opponent with my arms bent 45. So that means his arms must be bent 45. He grabs me. That's the only way I'd be striking with a bent arm 45 because he would be 45. If I want to strike his pressure points along this side, and or we use this one to strike the crazy bone area. Everybody's had the crazy bone wrapped, and it makes you jump and numbs your arm. If I strike his arm without the support of this hand, his arm moves. I do this. Hold his arm in place as I strike, and that gives me a better explanation for that move, and if I strike the crazy bone, I can strike the pressure point, or I can even strike the hand opening pressure point, and as I strike, my opponent will almost always dip, and especially if I strike as in the kata, you're supposed to strike hard. When I first learned that kata, I wasn't given a meaning, I was told this is just for power. Show how much power you have, hit the person. Through self-defense, if a man grabs me, I attack the pressure points with this, I hold his arm, and I immediately attack the face which would be coming in, in a real situation. He grabs me, I would support, I would strike, his face would be coming in, and an uppercut would take place using my opponent's weight against him. And that's the meaning of that move in the kata. When you step to turn, we have a self-defense from behind at that point, and you move into another motion where you step and you back fist. It looks like you punch, you back fist, you strike. They are releases from a grab, but we use a pressure point. Almost everybody knows that if he grabs my wrist, folks, everybody teaches this, that I can get out, hold tight, I can get out. Everybody in the whole world teaches that. But I have a technique I like better because if he grabs, I have my momentum. I have my momentum coming back at me. All he would have to do is close and push me and he'd have me off balance. All he'd have to do is push me because I'm pulling this way. That's too long of a count. One, two, it puts us equal. It puts he and I equal. He grabs me, we're equal. Dukes are back up and it's an equal fight. Maybe he'll win. What that tells me in the kata, the hand crosses and I strike because I am taking that pressure point out, which is a rub pressure point. I rub it, there's hit pressure points, and there's touch pressure points. That's a touch, not a hit. If I hit that, hold tight. If I hit that, nothing. He feels it, but nothing. But this, he feels, and he would be struck with a simultaneous motion at his body. I would not be pulling back towards my body and then trying to attack him. He would grab me, I would come on this pressure point, which will release it, and strike him with the same motion. So anytime anybody grabs one hand or two hands, we do not do this. We simply touch these pressure points 
together and strike. One hand and strike. Two hands. He can't stop you from doing this, by the way. Try that at home, just to have somebody grab you and put their hands like that. In some of your katas, that's just the meaning for why we do this. We end the kata, and the hands are crossed sometimes like that. And that's just the meaning for that. If he grabs here, both hands, he cannot stop me from taking his own arm and putting it on one of these pressure points. You have to have an opponent to try and experiment with that to see. You sometimes don't believe, you think maybe he's going along with it. But you get somebody to hold you, hold tight, don't let me go, and just go like that. And you're out of the move. Just use his own pressure point to strike. It. And that's the meaning for this move in that particular kata is the meaning. When we get into the moves, we will explain how important the stance are. If you practice any of these techniques, you should do it under the supervision of an instructor. And you should not, you should use restraint. You shouldn't be hitting pressure points hard. You should just mildly touch them, feel them out, get the feeling of it. An instructor should help you and or Come into one of my seminars. Everybody's invited. And we're going to leave with Ron doing Kata Sayusha. Kata Sayusha. The ancient art of self-discipline and self-defense. It's always fascinated me, and I guess that judging by the crowds who flock to see every new Chuck Norris movie, most people are as fascinated as I am by these talented and skilled people. Now, Reading, Pennsylvania is a long way from Hollywood, but there's a man who lives in Reading by the name of George Dillman. He is indeed a real-life Bruce Lee. To introduce you this unique man, let's go to Reading, Pennsylvania and George Dillman. like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I have to totally leave what I call reality, and I become another person. I just go crazy. I go into a trance. I go into another world, and it's the same kind of trance you would have to get in if you were in a fight situation. The knee is used defensively to block against kicks. Someone kicks at you, we use the legs to stop it, so we can counteract with a hand. George Dillman, black belt karate expert. Attention exercise shows his students that the body can break unbreakable objects. And the body can bear unbearable pain. There are 500 acupressure points in the body or, or acupuncture points that an acupuncturist can put needles. Well, when they put the needle this way, that, that might heal or soothe. But when I come in the other way, it causes damage, it causes pain. And with that, with the fingertips, I can actually knock people out. Okay. Let me at it. Let me at it. Let me at it. To be a student of George Dillman, as witness here, one must completely trust this black belt karate expert. In fact, Dillman contends that if a good boxer were to study under him, he'd be a world champion. If I were to work with Jerry Cooney, 
uh, he would beat Larry Holmes. If I would have worked with Thomas Hearns, he would have beat Marvelous Hagler. Uh, it's just that simple. He would have to believe me, he would have to trust me, and he would have to spend two months in a ring with me to get these points. And at that point, he could take anybody, and I could reverse boxing history. The most dramatic aspect of a Dillman demonstration comes when he prepares to slice two watermelons in half with a razor-sharp sword while blindfolded. I build a mental picture of everything that's going on out there, and then with the years of practice that I've had with that sword doing what we call kata, or forms, I know that this, the blade is going to be on target. I just have to get a mental picture of where the, uh, the watermelons are. Dillman and his students are world famous for their breaking skills. Dillman breaking as much as 1,200 pounds of ice with his bare elbow. Breaking is a show portion of karate. We jump up and break wood, we break boards, the public likes to see it, but we only do that once or twice in a year. The real study of karate is this, this inner peace that you get. Boy, I'll bet you Tommy Hearns is glad to know now that he could have beaten Marvelous Marvin Hagler if he had trained under George Dillman. I think I'd rather fight Marvin Hagler than train under George Dillman. United